if a student is, and this is really a question, not too much to this, I, I don't have a problem with this statement. I've, I have a, a concern that if a student is absent for a long term and there has been no contact with that student or that student's parents or whoever the guardians are, uh, can a student be uh, removed from role, in other words, unenrolled from a, from a Baltimore County Schools? And I'm talking about like, you know, six months or four months or five months, what has been, and, and despite the effort of interventions of the appropriate people on staff in order to do that, there has been no contact. I've had that situation very rarely um, okay. when there's been absolutely no contact and students disappear. I think I've come across that in 25 years twice. Mm -hmm. So it's very rare that that does occur. But if we would have an incident like that occur, we would then ask our PPW workers, principals, there's a process where principals will make the uh, people personnel worker aware and they will do a home visit just to, safe, to do a safe check. Because at that time, the child is violating Maryland attendance compulsory law, right. or the parent is. So we do everything that we can in our power to make sure, one, that the child is safe right. um, and that the parent is aware that the child has been absent and to determine the reasoning why. If there are reasons why the child has not been in school, then our PPW will work closely with the family and the social worker, if necessary, to provide additional wraparound services for the child and for the family. But we do not withdraw them because we have to know the whereabouts of a child. So if they've withdrawn and they've gone to another school system, then there's a process to transfer those records to the next school. I appreciate that. Uh, if a child is a runaway and, and we don't find, and maybe this has never happened, I don't know that way. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm seeing, and I'm just talking about this in terms of, uh, of, of the system's uh, importance of uh, attendance uh, st stats. If we have children that have run away and, and they have, and, and there is no contact with, with, with the parents, even with the children. So there will be contact with the parent or contact with the guardian. Um, if a child runs away, they still remain on our attendance roster because we have to know their whereabouts and okay. they still belong to Baltimore County Public Schools. Thank you. Uh, Next one is, uh, and I, ju I just want an example, uh, in uh, page six on four, uh, section four, uh, B, uh, B, uh, B1, could somebody give me an example of a, uh, for uh, pre -K or pre -K, K or first or second grade, uh, if they're expelled from school, if required by federal law? Gun-Free Schools Act. Excuse me? The Gun-Free Schools Act. Okay, If Thank they violate you. the Gun-Free that, Schools that, 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 Act, that's, that's uh, okay. mandatory. And the last question has to do with uh, uh, if someone is appealing a placement uh, from their school to uh, another, you know, from, from their regular school building to an alternative setting, and, and there is an appeal that occurs. Where is the student placed during the time of the appeal? The alternative center is the way that we have explained it in the or the way we're proposing it in the policy. Okay, so he would he would not be in the same school building, and even though there's an appeal, he will be at the at at the at the alternative place. There is not a stay put that we are putting in the policy. So stay put is the language used in in uh, special education uh, that pending um, any challenge to a particular student's placement, that student placement remains the same. Uh, we're not assuming that the student is necessarily special needs. If the student is special needs and there is an appeal of the placement, that would come under not this policy, but under the student's due process rights under IDEA. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. And Mr. Offerman, um, I do recall several years ago in um, another school system, there being the case of several students who were on the books uh, for whom the uh, September 1 count uh, was used and those students hadn't been seen in several years. Um, so there was a concern from the state that there was, that students were on the book, books fraudulently. So that is not the process um, that has occurred here, but that's the flip, I think, of your concern. Thank you. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Thank you. Also, in response to Mr. Offerman, but um, turning to Dr. Martin Knox. Um, I, I'm sure it didn't just drop off the abyss, but into the abyss, but I am certain that when we had students and we, 
did have students from time to time who appeared to have um, extended absences. Um, but we were always held accountable for working with our um, attendance officers to match, to make sure that we were uh, doing our, our due diligence in terms of contacting um, parents or foster parents, group homes, et cetera, et cetera, um, and found that sometimes the young people went to other systems and how they managed to get their children in but did and never notified anyone in the system but to make sure when we were doing our um, uh, attendance upkeep not just at the beginning to to take people off who had not we had not seen maybe in the past school year but for children who had maybe 10, 20 days out to make sure um, that they were still with us. So there was a process where we were matching. So I'm certain that that still in some way is happening. Is it the same? How, how does that work? You're absolutely correct. And when I was sharing with Mr. Offerman and I mentioned the utilization of the PPW, that's the step after the school's attendance committee has come together to determine who those students are that fall under that umbrella mm -hmm. of missing excessive days of absences. They work very closely with the PPW to determine where the child is located. And that includes doing a home visit as well. Um, so that was where I was going. And we that. knew to do that. I mean, that, that was a part of our responsibility to make sure that we were keeping abreast of the children who were out for periods of time. You are absolutely correct. That's why you were the wonderful principal you are. Okay, thank you so much. I, I was looking for that. Okay, <laughs> now I'll turn off my mic. Ms. Rowe. I saw it briefly in here, but can someone just concisely in lay terms explain to me what happens if you have a student who's present in the school building and is skipping classes and whatever, we can't expel them, we can't suspend them. Did I see here that in-school suspension is an appropriate discipline? So it would be a case-by-case -case basis. Um, once that child is met with by the school administrators, they'll first of all determine why the child is making the choice of not going to class. Mm -hmm. um, if there are some health reasons or some other reasons why the child has been avoiding classes, um, then they would have consultation with the school counselor in most cases or with the social worker, whomever um, could meet that child's needs. But in terms of uh, determining why the child is missing, we would have to bring a parent in to make them aware of the behaviors where the child is not, because it poses a safety issue when a child mm -hmm. um, is not going to class. We have to know where kids are at all times. Um, so whatever the consequences for that child in his or her truancy um, from class, that would be a case-by-case -case decision and determination. The last thing we want to do is suspend a child who doesn't want to be there because that's only allowing right. them to see that but you're now giving me that Did pass. I see that, um, maybe Ms. Howie can answer, did I see that in-school suspension is a possibility? That would be correct, but it would be a case-by-case -case okay. determination, and yes ma'am. when students are in in-school suspension, they are receiving instruction? They sure are, yes ma'am, they are. Okay, thank you. And so that goes back to Ms. Adekoya's question earlier. What's the difference when they're in school, they're receiving that, that intensive uh, instructional focus by a certified teacher? Thank you. Are there other comments or questions or discussion? Ms. Rowe? I just want to commend staff for doing an excellent job on this. This is very thorough, and I had read through Comar and tried to anticipate what they would do and decided that I would just let them do it. And now reading through it, it seems very, it's very good. Thank you, Ms. Holly, and the rest of staff who worked on this. I agree, and I do just wanna point out to the committee that all of the policies that we move forward from this committee to the full board go through a three-reader process. So if there were questions that committee members had related to any particular policy, um, we can, you can always email it to me and I can have staff uh, address it even before the policy comes back out to first reader and then goes through second reader and third reader, okay? Um, so if there's no more discussion and if there are no corrections, policy 5560 is moved forward for first reading as presented. Those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it and the motion carries. Policy 5560 will be moved forward for first reading. Next, we have policy 8130 formulation. 
Um, as you will recall, we asked staff to return to us this meeting with further refinements to the policy. Specifically, we asked staff to draft an alternative permitting the committee to review a policy after it had been presented to the board at first reader. Ms. Howie. Thank you. Members of the committee, uh, staff is actually presenting three alternatives uh, for your consideration. The first alternative, which is option one, uh, was uh, a specific request of the committee that there be an option between the first and second readers of policy uh, that permitted the, uh, this committee to review again changes to policy. We are also, we, you, were all, you also asked us to include an option between second and third reader. So for ease of reference, page four is where those changes are incorporated, specifically C3, um, an optional review by PRC following the first reading in the event that the public or members of the board present suggested revisions to the policy. The Policy Review Committee has the option of reviewing and incorporating in its proposal those comments from the public and board members. You'll also see in subsection 5 that another optional review exists between the second and third reader of policy. And because I'm visual and because Ms. Clark is so talented, at the very last page, what you have is uh, a visual of what option one looks like. We also have for your consideration a second option, which truncates the review. Here, staff is recommending that there only be two readers of a policy. And between the first and second reader, that there be the opportunity for public comment. And I'm sorry, at the first reader, there be public comment. Between the first and second reader, the Policy Review Committee has the option of reviewing the policy again to incorporate suggested changes. And then, that final vote of the board takes place at third reader. So that is your second option. Again, those changes are outlined at page four. And then finally, and you also have a, a graphic of what that looks like. And then you have a third option because we didn't want to leave you with too few options. And the third option you have three readers again, and then an optional review between the first and second readers. As well, we have those changes on page four and uh, a visual at the end of the policy, the recommended policy. So those are the options for your review as the policy review committee. Thank you. Is there any discussion or questions to start? Ms. Rowe. Can you please outline for us the amount of time for each one of these options it would take to get a policy through the process? I'm sorry I did not bring the um, the timeline that we presented last month, I'm happy to present it again, but my recollection is that the option that you're currently using, uh, that um, it would take upwards of five months for a policy to be presented here at PRC, and then again um, from soup to nuts for final review by the local board. Okay, so option one, um, what this allows is that we don't have to bring things back to PRC, but if PRC had a reason to want to, we could. Yes, ma'am. In between either one of these or both? In, in between either one, ma'am. Okay. I'm inclined to like option one. Here's my question back to the committee, and obviously it's the committee's pleasure. If the committee has um, 
public review at first reader, now instead of second reader, as you currently do, then I think my question would be, what exactly would be your reason for reviewing it yet a third time if the public is not contributing at second reader? Um, assuming that we have a policy where the public doesn't contribute at second reader, we wouldn't. But the option is there in case the public does come forward and something comes out of the woodwork that we didn't anticipate. I, I think the idea here is they have the option so that if the board does get blindsided by something they didn't, content, they didn't consider, either at first reader or second reader, we have the option to pull it back into committee. But you know, most of these policies aren't really controversial. So I don't imagine that the board would make more work for itself by pulling things back for no good reason. And that's where option two is a possibility that would streamline the process so that if you receive comments, since first reader is going to be when the public is commenting on your policies, that you as the committee receive the policy again, uh, indicate whatever changes you want, and then second reader would be the final vote. When we're talking five to six months between this committee looking at a policy and the board voting on a policy that simply delays further any action from the school system as to implementation if there are uh, very significant changes recommended by policy. So in a situation, hypothetically, where a policy goes into first reader, maybe the public has no comment. So then it goes right into second reader without coming to PRC. Maybe the public has no comment. I mean, I've seen this happen with policy after policy where the public just has no comment. And then it goes right into third reader. I, I can't see PRC pulling things that the public has no comment in back into the committee. So that wouldn't, option one under that scenario would not be a five month process, correct? That's hard. I don't know. I haven't timed it out. So I do not want to give you misinformation. I mean, because first reader is the first meeting, second reader is the next board meeting, and third reader is the board meeting after that. So that's like a month and a half. And that's if you have fewer than four policies. So if that policy is the fifth policy that you've looked at, um, your own practice limits the number of policies reviewed at a board meeting to four. Why are we doing that? I simply do as the board directs. Can I ask the rest of the committee why we're doing that? So the practice has been for the board to review four policies. Yes, it is. So if this committee wanted to move more forward at, at a time, we could consider that. Um, I think we would not want to consider that today, but put that as an item for us to consider so that staff could bring forward what has the past been and what would be the time allotted in the meetings, how it would impact the full board meetings. Um, I do want to point out a couple things, and okay, and then Mr. Offerman, is that first reader, um, now the public has more time between when the board meeting is published on board docs than they did previously because this board had changed that um, request of the system so that presenting it, having the public have the opportunity to comment on the policies at first reader is um, appropriate, I believe, um, and also for board members. The question I had for Ms. Howie is the um, nice diagram, thank you, Ms. Clark, for that. PRC could opt to review and incorporate those comments from public and board members. What is the process? Does the committee chair pull back the policies, or does the board have to vote on it to allow PRC to take it back? So uh, in classical parliamentary procedure, um, standard under Roberts, once the committee has uh, issued a report, it is no longer in the committee's hands, it's in the assembly's hands. So obviously um, every assembly has the authority uh, under Roberts to amend whatever its procedure is. Um, as contemplated by this particular policy, it would have to be the committee um, that even though the assembly has the report, the committee is then determining the next 
part of the process. So it would be the committee chair who indicates that it has to go back to committee. During the full board meeting, during the uh, opportunity to address policies. Okay. And Mr. Offerman? Uh, yes. I, um, I believe that option two is, is, uh, is the most time efficient uh, way to handle this and still gives the board the, uh, the ability to, uh, to decline a policy if uh, information becomes, becomes relevant after the, after the first reading that way. So we can then uh, you know, send it back to the policy uh, review committee and, I, and I, I, I think this is a, and I thank, again, the people who, who made these charts because it made it much simpler for me that way. So thank you very much. Uh, but uh, I think this is sufficient, and I think because of, uh, I, I don't know when the, I don't know when, when this was originally written or how it's changed in the past, but with uh, electronic communication being the standard in terms of information exchange between the public and, and, and the board and, and most other organizations, uh, the need for long periods of time until a next meeting would occur in order to, to personally vouch or to send a written letter or, or you know, that, that kind of thing. I, I think we're past that in terms of the, our use of uh, uh, technology. So I, I would uh, ask the board to consider uh, supporting uh, uh, option two. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Ms. Adekoya, did you raise your hand? Oh, I just wanted to know, um, was there a recommendation being made or is that the pleasure of the board? as to which one which option to take oh it's a pleasure of the committee and ms clark may recall but we do have currently mr offerman uh, a comment button that is made active uh, on the policy review website when there are policies um, on which the um, or for which the public can comment but I don't think we've gotten any comments in a month of Sundays. I'm not, I'm not surprised. <coughs> Mr. Offerman. Yeah, I have one additional question, and that, and, and this, that is, uh, is it possible for, uh, uh, or is there a need, or, or is it possible uh, to, to develop a policy that, w uh, well, that concerns me uh, as to when they'll go into effect in terms of time uh, in, uh, implementation? Uh, I'm thinking of policies that would change, you know, I, I would think most policies would, I shouldn't say most policies, I'd see there are policies that I'm, as, when they go into effect, I could see being uh, important to put in place now, but I also see some that would be inappropriate to put in until the new school year is, uh, is developed. Is, is, am, am, I, am I missing anything in that no, discussion? No, sir, not at all. Um, and usually what staff does when there is a policy analysis, if there is a significant change and we need time to turn the Queen Mary, that is this organization, <laughs> we do ask for additional time. For 8130, depending on what change um, the committee wants, initially what staff had asked was that whatever changes were put in place were not instituted until July 1. Thank you. Ms. Rowe. Uh, well, I share Mr. Offerman's desire to have a, a concise and fast process. I think that when we're looking at op option two, we really need to consider the fact that our area education advisory councils are charged by this board with the task of advising us on policy changes. And I think having three readers gives them as a group and as a committee the time to collaborate on that and find um, public consensus or feedback on those things. And I feel that if we condense this into two readers, it's possible that we be, should be, could be shortening the time frame so much so that it limits the effectiveness of our area education advisory councils. Can I make a observation? It seems that um, where the discussion lies removes option one from consideration. I think if we can narrow down, then we could maybe focus our discussion a bit more. Is there currently anyone that would uh, want to pursue option one? Okay. Hearing no one, we'll remove that as an option. And then option two um, versus the current policy. Is option three oh, the I'm current sorry. policy? Nope, no, I'm sorry. It's 
So there's option two and three and then the original. I am amenable to option three. I do like the idea of keeping three readers. <laughs> option three is your current practice. Um, and however, it's, it's modified. You do not, uh, or yes you do, you do review policies um, informally prior to third reader. But, excuse me, but, I, Mr. but, it, but, but it's policy three only allows for one, one period of time to have uh, the public, uh, the policy person online for, for, for public comment after the, as a second reading, then it says no opportunity for public comment. So wouldn't that in fact not allow the stakeholders or other public groups in, 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 order, to, uh, in order to have this additional time that, uh, that uh, Ms. Rowe is, uh, is uh, referring to? So if we pull, yeah, I see what you're saying. If we pull it, if we have first reader and the policy has public comment and then we pull it out and bring it back into committee and make changes and then bring it back out for second reader and the public has no opportunity for comment. I, I don't like the idea that the public, that we're limiting the opportunity for public comment in any way. I think the public should have as much opportunity to comment as um, so as they can have. option three is your current practice mm -hmm. and the public does have the opportunity to comment at the second reader in option three. Oh, they do. What okay. is added to option three is that there is an option for the policy public. review committee to review and amend between the second and third readers. It's just that the third reader, there is no public comment. You've gotten that on the second reader. Actually, Ms. Howie, there is in the documents that we have an option three where the uh, diagram is slightly different than uh, the page labeled policy 8130 current policy. That's the current policy, yes, ma'am, as opposed to option three. Okay, so that's, that is mm -hmm. slightly different. Mm -hmm. Correct. And I think, too, we need to make a distinction between public comment, which is that time reserved at the board meetings when everyone that signs up in advance of the meeting gets to speak, um, whereas there is also always the opportunity, as Mr. Offerman pointed out, for our public to reach us through email, emails, um, and also our stakeholders always get an opportunity at the beginning of every board meeting. So if there were an area advisory Right, they can group that. that did have a concern, they could use that opportunity ahead of the, um, at the very beginning of our meetings. So there are avenues, there are multiple avenues for our public to comment. I do also see the need um, to be able to move through these policies because for instance, our discipline policies, some of them are four years, it's been four years and we need to move through um, policies in order to really address changes to law and also to changes in, in what's happening currently in education. Does the chair have a recommendation on which one of these options? I will defer to the committee. Okay. Ms. Adekoya. Can I make the motion? Sure. Oh, okay. um, I make the motion that this committee um, chooses option two. So push to the Does full that need board. a second? Yes. I'll second it. Thank you, Ms. Adequate. Ms. Howie, just as a point of clarification, mm -hmm. um, when the board is voting on a policy that would be at second reader, um, would there be an opportunity at that second reading for board members to make amendments or corrections to the policies before it's voted on? The full board, yes. Okay. Because That's then it's not being they, returned they, they to the committee for further action. We go back again. Is there further discussion on Ms. Adekoy's motion? Okay. Yes, Ms. Rowe. I'd just like to restate that I, I have a I have an issue with not having three readers.
Ms. Howard, do you know relative to other school districts, three reader process, is that a Maryland state practice? Not to my knowledge. That has been the practice that has been put in place in Baltimore County. Um, I'm not aware that other school boards in Maryland have as complete a process as Baltimore County. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion? All right, hearing none, those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Opposed. The motion carries. And policy 8130 with option two will move forward to the full board. Moving on to policy 8315, meetings, participation by the public, and Ms. Howie. Thank you. Uh, members of the committee, uh, staff is only recommending uh, minor changes to policy 8315, which sets forth um, how you uh, determine who is participating at your regular public meetings. Specifically, uh, we are asking or we're recommending that you define stakeholder groups and that uh, your uh, editing conventions be adhered to. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Ms. Rowe? Um, is there any possibility of adding to our stakeholder groups a student so that there's a method and a policy that if a student wants to speak, they're not subjected automatically to the pulling of the names out of the box and that we have a place in our stakeholder groups for a student. Well, we do have the uh, Baltimore um, County Student Council that always has a spot at the beginning as a student group. Ms. Adekoya? Um, I love your recommendation, Ms. Rowe. I kind of sort of support it in a sense that, yes, we have the council, but hey, you may have a student that may not know about the council that has a recommendation or wants to voice their own perspective or point on an issue. Mr. Offerman? Uh, I, I, we always want to hear from students, obviously, we, as, as all of our stakeholders. I have two concerns. One, that, uh, that, that takes away then one more spot and that student would be given if any random student came or two students came, they would get priority over over other individuals who want to speak, who also have a, an, an, an equal right to, to speak. And secondly, uh, and this is just my experience here, um, the, I'm assuming, the, I mean, uh, from what I've seen just by practice, the speakers are selected randomly, okay? Uh, yet I didn't see anything in the, in the, uh, in the policy that, uh, for, now using the box system and, and the early sign up, I didn't I didn't see that spelled out in the uh, in the policy, or is it spelled out and I missed it? It is not. Okay. Well, I I, I, I would suggest that in order to try to be fair to the to the population who would want to speak, that that we consider putting in some some language, or, and I would open the suggestions to try to make sure that that it is a random selection. Okay, and as as, as part of our policy. And of course, I still want to recognize, you know, we have special guests, uh, lawmakers, and we have, you know, the other group. I think that's fine. I just, I just thought that we ought to make this officially official, and our policy is that uh, selection of the uh, of the speakers is uh, is is in fact random in order to be fair. Any other discussion, Ms. Rowe? So, is it possible that we could put on our stakeholder group sign in? one spot for a student, and the first student who shows up and signs up in that spot, they get that spot. Ms. Ms. Adekoy. And I'm guessing to support that, in a sense, you can have in there somewhere that the student meets with the student member and the student, they talk about what the student is about to um, speak about, because I guess a fear can be what the student comes up and says, and the magnitude of what's involved in what the student is about to say. So maybe there's a screening process real quick. Hey, what are you about to come and say? I 
don't think that pre-screening persons at public meetings is entirely consistent with the Constitution. Uh, because you're creating uh, a limited open, well, actually, it's an, uh, an open forum. So to indicate you get to speak and you don't, um, that I would not recommend. I would agree with Ms. Howie on that one. Um, Ms. Pesture? Yes, thank you. I, I do think it's a, a good idea to have um, that student voice. Um, I was worried about what happens if you have more than one student and they all get to sign up on that. But if we went with um, it being the first person who signs in that space, that eliminates that concern and it does offer a voice that is beyond the more organized one of the one coming from uh, the student government. Ms. Rowe. So I'd like to make a motion that we add to our stakeholder groups a student sign up to that list and that the first student that signs up is the student who gets to speak. Is there a second? Second. Um, I would just clarify that it's a Baltimore County Public School student. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. If you would take no. that as a friendly amendment. No. Yes, amendment. And second <laughs> yes. from all yes. three of the seconds. <laughs> okay. And Ms. Howie, to Mr. Offerman's point, is there language that you would suggest to um, clarify the process that we currently use or to? Okay. Is there any other discussion on this policy? Um, we have so uh, we, need we need to, to we need to vote on it as amended. Those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. The motion carries. Policy 8315 will be moved forward for first reading as edited. And Ms. Howie will also bring out language uh, referencing our uh, current selection process that is random. Next policy is policy 1110. Um, and for that, I ask Mr. Brandon Olin to come forward. It's policy 1110, publications, radio, television, and digital media. Good morning. Oop, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Michael Dickerson with Brandon Olin from Communications. I'm going to front this one for Mr. Olin. Um, this is his first uh, shot at this. Um, policy 1110 is... Um, a policy that acknowledges the Board of Education and the school systems um, understanding that uh, public relations contributes to student achievement and that providing information and effective communication to the community uh, is important. Um, we don't have any major changes to this policy other than um, acknowledging the PRC's uh, conventions, editing conventions. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments regarding this policy from the committee? Hearing none, we can go ahead and vote to move it forward. All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? The ayes have it and the motion carries forward. Thank you. Thank you. And the next, the next policy is 1200, community involvement. And I have here that Ms. Diana Spencer and Ms. Sue Han yep. will be presenting. Thank you, good afternoon. Hello. Diana's sick today, so you got okay. me and Michael. <laughs> okay, thank you. Go right ahead, Sue. Okay, so um, policy 1200 is um, regarding community involvement, and there were no changes except for the editing conventions. Are there any comments or discussions from committee members? Hearing none, policy 1200 is moved forward for first reading as presented. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion, the ayes have it. The motion carries. Policy 1200 will be moved forward for first reading. The next policy is 1260, school volunteers. And I have here that Ms. Spencer and Ms. Murray will be presenting. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. 
Um, uh, policy 1260 comes to you today for review. Um, there are no recommended changes with the exception of the committee's editing conventions. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments from committee members? Hearing none, I move we have policy 1260 move forward for first reading as presented. Those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Right. The ayes have it. The motion carries. Right. Policy 1260 will be moved forward for first reading. Thank you. The, thank you. The next policy is 1270, parent and family engagement. And for that, Ms. Hahn remains. Thank you. Thank you. That's correct. The policy 1270 is parent and family engagement, and there were no changes. Do committee members have any questions or comments related to policy 1260? Get rid of this one. I'm sorry. It's okay. 1270. <laughs> yeah. Hearing none, we'll move that policy 1270 uh, move forward. For, this is for third reading as presented. Those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. The ayes have it. The motion carries and policy 1270 will be moved forward. Thank you. Excuse me, there was a typo earlier that said third reading. This one is also moving forward for first reading. Our next policy is policy 4104, technology acceptable use policy for employees and approved non-employees. Presenting today, we have Mr. Jim Corns, Mr. Ryan Embriali, and? Ann Geisinger. Ann Geisinger. For Maria well, Lowry. Oh, okay, thank you. And uh, Mr. Embriali will be up for our next policy. Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, the policy for the uh, employees uh, acceptable use, uh, we are recommending a name change um, to reflect uh, current language to be more inclusive, to move to authorized users. Um, we are defining the term authorized user and uh, we've also uh, edited to uh, conform to uh, the correct board policies. Uh, we've also gone through and updated all of the titles across the documentation. Thank you. Do committee members have questions or comments? Okay. Mr. Corns, in paragraph two definition, yes. there's a phrase that says, uh, well, let me just read it. Authorized user, any employee, board member, or approved non-employee who has been sanctioned by the school principal or office head to have access to BCPS technology to carry out his or her duties for the school system. Uh, please give examples of office head. Uh, so an office head could be anyone from, um, for example, the head of a department uh, like uh, myself, uh, where I have employees that come on uh, come on board that I want to authorize to have access to our uh, software. It could be someone that would be, uh, um, I mean, the superintendent would have uh, head of her office. Um, just uh, anyone who has uh, employees that have the ability to request through uh, our means to have access to email and accounts online. Okay, so that would be distinct and different from department chairs, department heads, so it's someone in the central office. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Ms. Rowe? Under what circumstances would a non-employee be approved? So, um, we, have, um, we have individuals who are um, contractors uh, provided through um, a uh, agreement we might have that uh, the best case for uh, communication being email with that particular vendor uh, we've been uh, able to issue an email address to that employee who's kind of the liaison they aren't technically employed by Baltimore County they are contracted with um, we've had um, individuals who um, just in general they don't fit that the, the box of uh, us directly contracting with them or directly hiring them, but we've, need to have, we've needed to have communication back and forth with them uh, from an, an electronic standpoint that we didn't want to go off of our network to do so. Okay. And how, how is this um, suggested to be implemented, the, this particular phrase? The board expects that authorized users shall use school system technology in an ethical, professional, responsible, and legal manner. Is there 
forms that they need to sign? Are they subject to fingerprinting and, and screening similar to employees? So uh, the, the form that would be referenced would be uh, in, in this rule 4104, which has the, um, it has a very detailed list of things that are permitted and not permitted. And uh, uh, employees sign off electronically at the beginning of the year, but we have paper copy for anyone else who does not uh, come onto our network to sign on uh, that first time. And so that will be coming forward in the updated rule. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are there any other questions or comments? Um, so the question is on policy 4104 to move forward for first reading as presented. Those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. The ayes have it, and the motion carries. Policy 4104 will be moved forward for first reading. The next policy is Policy 6202, Technology Acceptable Use Policy for Students. And presenting, we have Mr. Korn staying with us and Mr. Ryan Embriali. Good afternoon. Hello. So in, in this uh, policy, this is the student version of the acceptable use policy, as we just went over uh, for the... Uh, um, authorized user um, previously. Uh, we've updated some language and terminology. We've also aligned the method by which we collect this information to our current practices. And uh, we've uh, reviewed for informs to the uh, board's um, uh, editing conventions. Do board members have comments or questions regarding this policy? Ms. Rowe? Um, in section 2A, can you explain the addition of that enriches the curriculum and the instructional program? I guess my question is, um, that seems very broad. There's a lot of things that could enrich the curriculum and instructional program, and I'm just wondering if having that language in our policy doesn't uh, create kind of an open door for anything and everything that might be more entertainment than educational or I'm concerned with this language being in the policy. So that language goes along with the words that are preceding it, which is promoting innovation and learning. So we're, we're changing what used to read there to now read promoting innovation and learning that enriches the curriculum and the instructional program. Define enriches. Well, I can define it the way I would perceive that. That's adds to, enhances. How does the curriculum department define enriches? Well, I, instead of defining enriches, I think I would say that um, using our continuous improvement processes, looking at data, um, thinking about our curricular roadmap, we have internal processes for um, reviewing, procuring with this board, um, entering into contracts with different pieces of technology, software, hardware. And so it is not that this would open up an open door for things to suddenly appear for students that have not gone through several approval processes. Um, but each of those would be independent, right? Um, in ELA, that might be a combination of a print and digital textbook. It might be a um, online curation that you just actually, um, we did a name change at the last meeting, so it really depends. But it is not that um, teachers can simply decide, oh, I want my students to use this resource that isn't approved. We have things that we mm -hmm. curate so they know what are the approved things that um, come with the security of being in our ecosystem that come with having our student data privacy agreement signed and things like that. And Ms. Rowe, keep in mind that this is the board's policy. So the board is directing staff uh, in the broadest fashion possible about what standards you want staff to follow in getting these resources. I think that rather than just saying that we're promoting innovation learning that enriches the curriculum in the instruction or program, that the language 
should somehow take into account that we're that yes we're trying to enhance the results of instruction but we're not trying to do so by just pulling everything in that might be out there that might be considered an enrichment. My problem with the word enriches is that I feel like it's overly broad and I mean cartoons can be enriching, right? So the, it leaves a lot to interpretation and I think that I would want something narrower or more specific that results in some sort of academic outcome. Ms. Adekoya. Oh, so I'm guessing my question is, if enriching isn't suitable, what mm -hmm. word would be suitable? And um, in a sense, if cartoons are enriching to what's being taught, is that so bad? It is only because in the broad scope of everything that could enrich a curriculum, there are only so many minutes in a day that we have to offer instruction. And I don't think that I would want to open the door that everything that might be enriching but doesn't have bang for the time-related buck. And I'm not really sure how to word that, but I'm uncomfortable with the current language. Ms. Rowe, would you be agreeable to the word supports? Because we don't want enriches to be confused with enrichment. Perfect. So a motion to amend that to change enriches to supports. Is there a second? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Ms. Clark, if you would note that word change, please. Thank you. Other questions or comments? I had two briefly. Mm -hmm. One dovetails with Ms. Rowe uh, earlier comments related to where is it um, how best should it be worded in order, the whole point is to provide academic achievement, mm -hmm. to allow our children to achieve the goals of the program of education as outlined in other policies by the board. Um, because I'd, I'm, not seeing, I'm not seeing that in here, and maybe I've missed it. So is there a phrase in here that you feel particularly supports academic achievement? or spells that out? I believe it's in IA, where it says the board further believes that providing access to information technologies and resources is a key in equipping students with the skills needed to become lifelong learner, learners and compete in the 21st century. Actually, I think that's where we can, I think that's where we might include something. The other question I have while I ponder that is, um, under 2B, it talks about students will be required to acknowledge the technology acceptable use policy mm -hmm. for students through BCPS 1. Mm -hmm. um, but where is a piece where the parents have review and signed off that they understand what is required of their student? So that's all, all a part of the handbook process. And then electronically, um, there is the option for parents in the rule to go through the opt-out process, depending on what they're looking for in terms of um, opting out of various pieces of directory information, for example. So does this policy then, as it stands, remove the paper version of the student handbook that the parents no. receive at the beginning of the year? Because we've heard adamantly that the parents like that coming home in its entirety. Still comes home. Still comes okay. home. And then is there a requirement for parents to sign a form and send it in so that they're on record as understanding the standards that their student is going to be held to? There is a, there is a. For the preposition, Ms. Pesture. <laughs> <laughs> there is a, there is a form included within the student handbook that in, in uh, that is uh, the parents signing off that they've received and understood the handbook as a whole. Okay, because in here it talks about the students, but it does not talk about the parent having. So, so Ms. Cosby, the, 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 um, the sign-off process is uh, still held within the parent handbook. The acknowledgement, so the students have the interaction is through BCPS1, which is an acknowledgement that as soon as they, they enter and then use, they, they click and move. Okay, so the and parent approval 
is in the rule and will still be in the handbook that is sent home mm -hmm. at the beginning of every school year? Yes. Yes. Okay. Pa parents are referenced often in rule in the rule 6202. Okay. All right. Thank you. And then I would um, make a motion to include language in paragraph 1A. Hmm. Actually, we'll take it down to 2A, where you had included that supports the curriculum and the instructional program. In order for students to achieve or to support that supports the that supports the curriculum comma, the instructional program, and student achievement. That is a motion. Second. Is there any discussion? All in favor of that amendment say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that amendment carries also. Any other discussion? Hearing none. We uh, move policy 6202 forward for first reading as edited. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The, mo the ayes have it and the motion carries. Policy 6202 will be moved forward for first reading as edited. Thank you very much. And here we are. Well, I really appreciate the work of the committee and the work of staff. We have uh, worked through our agenda. Um, I have added on our agenda, we have item four, Committee General Good and Welfare. The floor is now open to members of the committee to discuss issues of concern uh, or possible future agenda issues. I must emphasize that this is not the time to conduct business as there has not been notice provided as required by the Opens Meetings Act. Is there anyone that would like to offer anything for the committee to consider? Mr. Offerman? Only a thank you to Ms. Hal for uh, organizing this in a way that uh, we can get through it, I think, in a very efficient manner. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And in, in speaking to the efficiencies, we again want to point out that we moved the meeting from its regular time to 11 so that we could complete our work because there are a number of board members and staff that are going to Annapolis today uh, for the march in support of education funding. So we definitely appreciate that. Um, I also did want to uh, just remind committee members that at any time that you have questions regarding any of the policies under review or that are coming forward, please email them to me and Ms. Howie uh, for consideration. As Mr. Offerman pointed out, with our uh, use of email and so forth, there is still a lot of um, comments that can be forwarded. Yes. Um, I would just like to know if we ever did get the live stream for this meeting working or is this in the live stream started, could you tell us approximately what time the live stream started? I wish I could tell you, uh, sometime after 12. Okay. So we had about um, an hour of the meeting that would be represented by written minutes as prepared by staff. And so the last hour has been live streamed. So we did have a technical difficulty earlier. Um, also, I did want to say that our next meeting is going to be April 15th at 4.30 here in this room. And um, if there is no further business, the meeting is now adjourned. Thank you very much.